Right, so it's, it's mostly on, yeah, on the topics that you can see on the board, which is engagement, privatism, and NGOs in the Czech Republic and possibly elsewhere. So these are the topics I'm interested in, and uh, I want to show you, like I said, a few graphs to kind of show you the context. Uh, this is the first graph which uh, <clears throat> shows, you, shows you the the share of people who are not interested in politics, who claim they are not interested in politics. It's organized by country. Uh, um, Czech Republic is right here, if you're interested. Those are OECD countries. And um, the blue bars represent a share of population who say we are not at all interested in politics. But what I think is even more interesting is the, the sort of light blue squares at the top of these bars. These are young people. These are young people between 15 and 29 years of age. And there you can see that with Czech Republic, comparable perhaps only to Lithuania here, there is an unusually high score. There is up to 60% of young people who say they are not at all interested in politics. Now, the interesting thing about this, apart from itself being interested, is uh, this is old data. We don't really have very good new data on this, but this is from 2014, so it's eight years old, meaning that the people who were 15 to 29 by then, today are something like, what, 23 to 37. So the generation which is leaving the universities and the young adults, which by many were considered to be the first generation born after the fall of communism. So there were hopes, connected to this generation. And if you look at the graph, you can see that the generation actually is faring much worse in comparison to their parents, for instance. Uh, this and other things is sometimes in sociology seen as a symptom of a process which people call privatism. And privatism means a retreat from the public sphere into the private. So basically, losing interest in what is happening around me and focusing on the private sphere of the sort of private world. You can see some of this on this, on this map of priorities, which is mapping um, yeah, the Czech Republic and, and the values of the Czech citizens between 1993, so the, end, the beginning of the transformation period, so to speak, and 2015, so 22 years later. And you can see that Family is very important, and it always was, and work is very important as well. But the other two, or the other four actually, friends have become more important for people over the time, and free time has become much more important. Of course, free time in terms of individual time consumption, right? While the collective things, politics, religion, are becoming less important. So this would be one more sort of indicator of privatism. People are worried about privatism in sociology and social sciences. People are worried about privatism because they believe that in a privatist society, people tend to put their own interests first and they tend to look for ways to gamble the system or cheat the system or find your way around the rules somehow. Right? And, and we have had plenty of empirical examples of this in, in our country. I, I, I can show you just the pictures are sort of illustrative for what I'm talking about. The first thing on the left, I don't know if you recognize this, this is an anti-radar. That's something you can put in your car and then when you go too fast, you can escape the, the, the punishment, which you deserve. <laughs> which you deserve and you should be punished, but you won't because you have this tool which allows you to, um, to escape a just punishment. So that's a way of sort of sidestepping the rules. And in most European countries, these things cannot be sold. They can be sold in the Czech Republic and they are heavily used here. The second picture is, uh, for many people from this country are very familiar. Uh, this is the, just during the time of the pandemic, we have lots of these examples of having rules and finding ways, creative ways around them. So when they don't, when, when they say you are not allowed to go skiing and the ski lifts must be stopped, what people do is they employ one of these devices and they, they fix a rope to this device and then they use this device to, um, this vehicle to go up and down the slopes. That's the kind of thing that people also talk about when they talk about privatism. Privatism is also very much connected to trust. So um, if you don't trust the institutions, then you are likely to behave in a, in a privatist way, right? So uh, 
This again is a graph which is showing uh, the Czech Republic is here. You can find the other countries, I think, as well on the axis. Uh, shows you trust in institutions. There's trust in government as well, but that's not so important for us because you know, trust in government is, has to do with who you voted for and so on. What is much more important is trust in institutions such as civil service, such as police, such as the educational system, such as the state in general. And, and there is a sort of a link that I can probably show you, I can probably show you um, with this slide. Um, there is a sort of a vicious circle, right? If you, if you don't trust the institutions, then you are likely to look for an individual solution to things instead, right? You are likely, if you don't, if you think that the institutions are ineffective, if you don't trust them, then you are likely to engage in some sort of private solutions to your problems, like working in the gray economy or doing things in an unofficial way. And the more people do this, the less effective the state institution, institutions are because they can't reach you over there in your gray economy. And the less effective they are, the less people trust them. And again, right? So it's a, it's a sort of vicious circle with mistrust in institutions on the one hand and privatism on the other hand. This would be uh, an illustration or something that you might have also noticed. This was 2019, uh, a story which went around the world from Romania, where a local entrepreneur was so heavily frustrated with the Romanian government's perceived inability to build a proper road network that what he did was he built a one meter of highway on his own land and he and he made, a, he made a grand opening where he invited the media and he opened this one meter of highway so you can see how a one meter of highway looks like. And it, it was, actually it was a very effective public communication. It was you know, cited everywhere. Um, and it was a publicity stunt, of course, but it illustrates the kind of principle that when the institutions doesn't work or if I don't trust the institution, then I will do things by myself on my own, that sort of attitude. So, given all this that I've said, you would expect the Czechs to be very passive people in terms of civic engagement, which is not always so. This is the most recent data from um, the European Values Study, and, uh, and it's about various kinds of civic engagement. So, here's a question, have you ever signed a petition? It's organized, the, the blue bar say, yes, I have done, and the, the orange bar says, uh, no, I would never do that. Okay? And, and it, well, the Czech Republic is sitting somewhere comfortably in the middle, it's not so bad, <laughs> right next to our brothers, Slovakia, uh, so, like we always do. Uh, so it's not so, you know, it, the picture is not as bleak as I ma made it look like. And uh, have you ever taken part in a boycott? Again, I mean, this is anecdotic evidence, right? This is, not, this is, a, this is a proxy, if you like. Uh, you can see on the graphs there are some countries which have a strong civic culture, like Sweden or Great Britain, and some which don't, but it's, a, it's, it's really a proxy. Have you ever attended a lawful demonstration? That's another question of this kind. So you can see that in terms of actually engaging in public matters, the Czechs are not so bad the way it looked like from the beginning. Um, and I think there is, a, there is something, to do with, um, there's something to do with culture. There's an explanation which has to do with culture. We, we tend to be engaged. We tend to look on civic engagement as something generally positive, but we tend to look at politics specifically as something negative in a way that you can see that probably when, um, so when somebody enters a political party and people react by, why are you doing this? What, what is in it for you? What is your private gain out of it? Because this is the privatist thinking. We tend to think somebody goes into a political party and, and you tend to think there must be a private profit in, this per in it for this person. There, there, there must be, right? This is the kind of thinking, the kind of suspicion that there is a, um, because in politics, yeah. Um, so, so there's one reason that people often refer to politics as a sort of opposite of reason, of common sense, of hard work. I can, of course, 
remind you of the former Prime Minister of the Czech Republic, Andrei Babiš and his party. He had a campaign which was explicitly built on this, this idea. There's politics, that's the bad thing, and then there's expertise and reason and hard work, and that's the opposite, so to speak. Yeah. So people are engaged, but they are not so much engaged in politics, because politics is a dirty word. But we have a dirtier word than politics. Activism, of course. And again, uh, people are active, but they can't hear of activism. Activism is something which is, uh, which is very much charged with negative meanings. Activists, somebody who is you know, opposed to rationality, opposed to common sense, and so on, in the public discourse. So this should be somehow reflected. You would think this kind of stance should be somehow reflected in the trust that people have in NGOs in the country, in the Czech Republic. And it is, in a sense, these are the, yeah, um, these lines show you um, the levels of trust that people report for NGOs. The blue line is trust, the red line is mistrust. Uh, I think you can identify the point where these two lines cross and never come back. And that's 2015. And that, of course, is the refugee crisis. Okay. It varies, it varies very much by, not very much, but it varies considerably by age and education. But overall, there is this um, sort of um, negative or, or, or mistrust in general. But again, but again, uh, this is the big picture and there's a detail. These are NGOs in general, and now I will show you the levels of trust in environmental NGOs. Again, in an international comparison. And I have organized the data uh, by, uh, by the yellow columns. And the yellow columns say, uh, I have no trust in an environmental organization at all. Not at all. Eh? This is where Ch the Czech Republic is. Yeah. So say for Albania, the Czechs are the least trusting when it comes to when it comes to environmental organizations, and uh, uh, can you explain a little bit why is that? Yeah, I mean these are quite clearly these are different kinds of NGOs, right? There is a there is a difference between NGOs and NGOs, and that's also the point that I'm sort of arriving to, and it's it's my final slide, so I might as well put it on. Um, or um, no, no, we'll explain now. Um, I think that there is a, overall, if you look at the structure of NGOs in the country, most of them have to do with sports, and most people are engaged in sports, or you have people who, who are breeding animals, you have gardeners, and you have all these kinds of NGOs that people don't typically perceive as NGOs. But then there is this public face of NGOs, which is a tiny, 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 tiny little layer of NGOs, usually connected with the environment or with the protection of weak people, so to speak. Yeah. So sexual minorities, racial minorities, and so on. And these, these NGOs are the sort of, like you see here, the sort of bad face of the sector, if you like. Even though, like, like I said, it's a tiny fraction. So we, we are able to live in this kind of schizophrenia. We are able to live in, we all are active and we all are in NGOs, but not, not, not these kind of NGOs, right? So there is a difference. There's a difference between NGOs and NGOs. That's, that's the one point that you can see there. You have NGOs and NGOs, and people, people are able to compartmentalize. People are able to, to make that distinction in their, in, the, in, in their minds and see it as meaningful. Uh, yeah, so there's just some summary points to what I said. Um, uh, privatism and mistrust in institutions are two things which foster each other. So they fuel each other. Privatism makes us trust institutions less, and mistrust institutions make us a privatist more, so to speak. There's a difference, there's a perceived difference between being engaged, being active, and being political. Being political, or even worse, being activist, is perceived as a, as a bad thing, even though people are active, actually. And the same thing goes for NGOs. People are active in NGOs. There is a network of NGOs, but people don't take NGOs 
seriously because they have this public face, which is, of course, a very politicized and very contested face. So, um, yeah, so those are some of the observations. I, yeah, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I would be really interesting uh, the thing with the with the environmental uh, NGOs because in Slovakia it's uh, I would say a little bit opposite. Uh, many uh, many activists in the in the civil society came out out of the uh, environmental organization and uh, they, they are like I would say like the backbone of the civil society in Slovakia. So and also the the numbers you have shown are are quite uh, quite different in. Uh, in, uh, in Czech Republic and in Slovakia, so that that surprised me uh, really, really a, a lot. That uh, although our countries have a lot of a uh, lot of common, and usually the the graphs are very much the same, this is uh, this is a thing that, uh, and just mine uh, thinking would be maybe does it have something also to do with the with the uh, with the mining mining uh, companies and the, and the the campaigns that were like uh, against at the uh, northern part and. In Czech Republic, uh, something like that, maybe. It's just my first. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it was a puzzle for me when I when I first saw the graph. I didn't really expect this to be so bad. I know they are because precisely what you say. The, the environmental organizations are a backbone, and they are also historically the backbone. I think that in say the 1980s, the, the if there was anything like a civil society, it was environmental organizations. So. Uh, I, I, I think that, that there is perhaps one one difference could be, or it seems to me, that there is a sort of added visibility in the Czech Republic, uh, and there is a highly contentious events that uh, people use when it comes to actions by, say, extension rebellion and so on, and it becomes it, it sort of becomes easily politicized. It becomes easily a part of a discourse. But um, the thing is, the the people who would be protesting against the environmental organizations here, the politicians in particular, they don't, I don't think they really you know, speak about environmental organizations. There is a sense of uh, uh, you know, migration politics and environment politics, and it's all kind of glued together in a sort of political package, which is being sold to the voters as this is the evil thing. And it doesn't really have much to do with the environment. Actually, you can, you know, you, you can sell the environment as a, as a conservative value. And people do that in, in other countries and elsewhere. It's, it's a very realistic option. But it's not what happens here. It's actually here environmental activists are seen as a, as a, as a threat for the system, as a young people who have no idea what they are doing, school strikes, you know, of course, the kind of, uh, um, yeah. Yeah, and also the thing like uh, you, you distinguish between NGOs and NGOs. That's the fact that uh, that we are really like facing in our everyday life. That uh, that uh, NGOs who are dealing with uh, children, uh, animals, old people are the good ones, and those ones who are going uh, too political. I mean, uh, I would like name it like those who are uh, involved in any kind of advocacy activities or trying to improve the the system. You logically become a, a, a political. So those are. The, the pet ones uh, and yeah so <laughs> and uh, yeah we can we can see also the the impacts of it also in in Hungary I think very very hard so what what would be your uh, your your uh, recommendation maybe how we we could uh, we could deal with uh, with these issues and also within this really changed uh, society how we can not to lose the the connection with the with the people with with the with really with the roots uh, in the in the society. Yeah, um, the thing is, this is not the only occurrence. We have um, we have worked together. Um, was it two years ago? I think with um, with Človek in here in Prague, uh, we have worked on a on a report on how migrants and migration are portrayed in the media. And we basically found out the same thing as here, that there is a huge number of migrants in the, well, not a huge, no, no, not really, no, no. Back then, well, there's a number of migrants in the Czech Republic. They mostly come from Ukraine, or from Rom Romania, and you meet them every day in the shop and everywhere. But when people speak about migration, they don't really mean those migrants. 
the large number. They mean the tiny fraction of people who come from non-European countries and who they are very, 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 very afraid of. It's the same sort of logic with the NGOs that people, uh, and, and it really is a, at the heart of it, there's a split between the lived reality, I think, and the, and the media reality. So from my perspective, the, the onus is on the media and it's on how, how they portray the problem. Or you could probably, if you want to put this kind of, um, with reference to the NGOs, you could say that, uh, you know, the, the agenda has been stolen from the NGOs. It has been stolen in, and, and sort of interweaved into, 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 into other discourses and in, into some kind of political entrepreneurship where, where you can use this signifier to, you know, to say things. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I can't think of a good idea what to do about it, except, of course, to make your case public and to speak, because if somebody steals your words, you must win them back. So you must, you know, you, you have to be loud about what, what, what you're doing, because in a sense, like I said, if they steal your agenda, you must stand back for it. And one last question for me, and then, then the floors uh, will be yours. Uh, your first slide was uh, about the young people, and that's uh, what, what really uh, interests me and frightens me, uh, because uh, in Slovakia there have been uh, several researchers which, which said that one-third of uh, Slovak young people wants to leave the Slovakia. And uh, especially young people have been really and particularly hard uh, attacked by the, uh, and influenced by the, by the pandemic. In Slovakia, the schools have been closed for seven months in one school year. So now we are facing a, a really huge uh, and robust problem within the mental health of uh, young people. Uh, other researchers uh, said that they really do not feel that they are part of the society, which I think are really trends very, uh, very, very negative. And uh, how we can build a cohesive uh, uh, society and uh, trying to facing the, the challenges we are facing right now when the young people who, who, who should be the, the motor of it and who used to be in, uh, in, in the past or within the Velvet Revolution and stuff like that, they, they just do not feel that they are part of it and they want to leave, or many of them. Yeah, uh, this is tough because um, I, th I think I can see exactly what you're talking about and it's a... Uh, it has to do with, um, say, if, if, if you look at the, you know, the 1989 Velvet Revolution and the students' involvement in it, and every kind of revolution you have students involved in it, why? Well, because students are somebody who is not really, uh, I, I can't put it like this, they don't have the luxury, that's not luxury, but they are somehow, some, with one foot, they are away from the system. They, they, students can afford to trust in values and to do things uh, sincerely without compromises. I, I can't go to demonstration. I, I have two small children. They have to go to the kindergarten. I have, a, you know, I, I have a loan for my flat and I need to go to work tomorrow, blah, 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 blah. Come on. Yeah, I can't, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> but the students can. That's the sort of historical how it always was. I don't think it's like this anymore. I think it was like this, this kind of idea of students as an alternative. It was precisely like this because, in a sense, students were living in this kind of alternative universe. They had this privilege that for some time they don't have to be in this rat race, get better every day, work on yourself, get better, blah, 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 blah. blah. They didn't have to be there. When I look at my students today, I think they are in it. I think that their first thought is not what, you know, how do I make my time great, but how do I make my time effective? How can I improve myself? What do I do in terms of uh, what, what is profitable and so on? So, but it's not like, a, I don't think you could tell them they are doing this on purpose. I think uh, they, that's what they, they are reacting rationally to what they are seeing around themselves. So yes, they are, uh, yeah, they, they have been put in a position where uh, their natural drive would be to go and try to be individualist and successful in that sense, which of course makes it difficult for them to act as this kind of uh, uh, saviors in a revolution or something. I think that's, uh, that's how things are. Yeah. That's not uh, a very thank optimistic Thank you. Thing. So please, uh, now the floor is yours. Yes. 
Hi. I have a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is whether you also look at trust at the individual level, if you have any data on that or thoughts that you can share, and whether it correlates to trust or mistrust in institutions. Uh, not so strongly. Uh, the, the differences between countries in terms of the individual trust are, are, are smaller. And the difference is, say, I mean, specifically, I was looking at, say, Czech Republic and Austria to kind of compare the sort of Eastern and Western country, if you like. And, uh, and there are huge differences in trust in institutions, very small differences in trust among individuals. There are differences, not too big. Uh, but I mean, well, not so much between countries, oh. but uh, like, say, if in the Czech Republic there's very low trust in institutions, is there also very low trust person to person? Yes. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, but does the data tell us that as well? Yeah, it's, it's comparatively lower. It's, uh, you, you would be, of course, you wouldn't be surprised to see that people who report more trust in NGOs tend to be more trusting in interpersonal relationships. Actually, people who trust NGOs also tend to be, the relationship is weak, statistically, but they tend to be happier. That's a good news for so, us. So, so people in this room are probably happier than people outside of this room. That's the, the sort of... I see a new nice logo for your PR campaign. <laughs> um, thank you. I also wanted to ask whether... Um, well, okay, so when you had that slide about uh, what is important to people, family work, and then the things that are more public, where does the community level fit into that, or whether you look at that at all? So how do people think about... Um, things that they might do for those very local NGOs that you were talking about before, like the gardening club or, you know, uh, firemen and all that kind of stuff. What importance do they place on that? And what kind of trust do they have in that? I don't know if you have any data on, on that community level, where that fits into people's values. Let me think. Um, well, not in this research that I have quoted. Um, um, you could probably find the data in terms of the number of organizations like this and the membership in these organizations. Though, um, yeah, I couldn't really, I, no, I, I, I can't give you a, a, a number or a trend like this, really. Um, I think that, uh, you know, you have some voluntary organizations that were, where, where, but, but these are like, say, uh, the labor unions where the membership is dropping rapidly and has been dropping for a while. Uh, with the sort of gardening uh, initiatives, well, the numbers are rising, but that's because people want their own garden. Okay, so it's kind of tricky to judge that, yeah, we have so many gardeners, and, but they don't really, that's not an act of community. That's an act of, I want a garden, so I need to join this thing, or I, yeah. So it's kind of difficult also to judge from uh, the motivations. Okay, thanks. Petr Lebra, Globalis. Thanks a lot Paul, for a really interesting uh, presentation. It just reminded me that uh, we have run quite an extensive uh, research at the beginning of this project on perception of NGOs in the Czech Republic that I think we only shared with the consortium members, but we can make it a part of the package of documents for this conference and share it also with uh, everybody else, including, including uh, you. I also want to take this uh, uh, opportunity to make a small promo for your book, which uh, your presentation is based on. And it's Namas Polechnost. I was going to show it, but I left it on my bedside table, and I'm still I'm still reading it. I have about two thirds through. Really excellent. Uh, um description of phenomena in a, in, a, in a really accessible language, I have to say, uh, speaking our uh, NGO jargon. The question I have, which might be also tricky, is related to the privatism and the relation between cheating the system and being anti-system. Because I feel that uh, the anti-system uh, approach, which kind of is an umbrella for being anti-vax, anti-Ukraine, anti-European, anti-NGO, anti-environmental, has uh, some a common sociological base, uh, which we are struggling with because this is the key for the polarization and fragmentation of the, of the, of the societies. And I feel there could be some relations, some correlations with the privatize, privatism phenomenon that you are describing. But there are two different things, so I would like to hear your opinion on 
how much of, uh, of, of the base, basically, for this anti-system feelings and emotions that people carry in themselves and they kind of like keep accumulating now uh, is actually relatable to, uh, to, to, to what you perceive as privatism. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the kind words. Uh, uh, I think um, the problem with, I think the problem with privatism is that, um, or in order for privatism to be a problem, it has to be a majority thing. So it has to be, you know, uh, people cheat on taxes. People don't, so if you have a, you know, so there's a worker who comes into your home and he says, let's, we, we, let's do this without the paperwork, come on. And, uh, and let's, you know, you have a car, but you, you are not the owner because your wife is the owner because it's kind of, and she doesn't drive, but she's the owner of the car. Because uh, we, uh, people do this all the time. And the thing is, not that people do this more or less, but that people consider this okay. That it's, it, it's morally acceptable. It's not like, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you steal a bottle of wine in a shop, it's not morally acceptable. You don't, you don't boast about it to your friends. But if you sit with your friends in a pub, you tell them, oh, don't, you know, ride the car to your wife. It's better. You know, you can, you can, you can speak about it openly because it's a majority thing and because people consider it normal and you know that others are also sort of in it. So that gives it the, the, the sort of um, moral benevolence. While with the anti-system sentiments, I hope, I, I think that it's still not a majority. Um, I think when, I'm, 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 I'm not sure how it looks now, um, I know that one year ago during the pandemic, um, the, the, the Center for Empirical, Re Empirical Research, STM, uh, they were doing um, a, a survey on how many people are sort of actively involved in the, disinfo the disinformation scene. And they said that there were 10, approximately 10% 10 of people who were actively spreading disinformation, so anti-system in that sense. And the pandemic has added three more percent to that. So they would say 13% of people who actively spread the emails, who actively look for the news and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. Of course, there's another huge part of the society which is looking for these kind of things, right? But the people who are spreading this, it's, it's still a kind of minority. So in a sense, there is probably some kind of a relation, but, uh, but yeah, privatism has to be a majority thing, and and this anti-system thinking is still a, a, a still a minority thing. Even though, of course, you have people who are kind of vulnerable to it, who are a large larger group than these thirteen percent. I think. Yes, there is the question, and then Veronica. Hi, um, thanks, uh, uh, Goran Malinsky uh, from OSF. Uh, quick question, um, whether you have data to show something about uh, between the social classes or the strata about this sort of trust in the other, because I'm really curious where it is broken down. And I'm asking with a particular uh, thought on mine, because usually um, uh, middle class is cheating a lot and is not aware. For example, middle class gets a cleaning lady paying in cash. Uh, and that's actually a subsidy to the middle class. You're thinking that the cleaning lady gets away with a tax, but actually she gets away without pension. Uh, and, and, and that means a, a major societal problem. Uh, and then when you move on, actually, you see that the whole web uh, um, is done to uh, really help the, those on the top and the middle class. So is there any data that could disaggregate? Uh, and I have one short comment on the environmental organizations. I'm absolutely not surprised at your numbers. Actually, I'm surprised how in Slovakia it's more positive because um, uh, why? There's an active industry appeal, active politicians appeal to make them bad. And more revolutionary they look, there's like, uh, you know, environment versus your job, environment versus your bread, and that has been won. And that's why actually I personally think from a comparative view, and this is not only Eastern Europe, it's also Western Europe, that the solution goes through economy. Actually, those organizations should simply scrap environment and say, like, it's better for you, for your well-being, economy, alternative agenda, and then coming to a real agenda. I, don't, I, I, I personally think that regaining the agenda can be done only by a proxy, meaning alternative agenda where you don't mention your words, 
you win the battle there, and then you slowly show the link that this is also the environmental agenda. Because some of those things have been tarnished beyond repair in the public eye because of politicians and businesses really actively putting resources in that. Thanks. Right, yeah, thanks a lot for this. Uh, I think we are, um, <clears throat> in terms of class, um, we don't, I mean, the, first of all, most of the graphs that I have shown regarding trust have a dimension of education, and education is also a, very typically a, a positive correlate of trust. So you can use education as a proxy for class and, and go from there. Um, of course, we don't have a good measure for class because we have income, but increasingly, Czech Republic and other countries is becoming a country where inequality is not based on income, but on property, of course, and you can't. Yeah, but the thing, um, the, the thing that you are saying about the cleaning lady, I think, is a perfect example because we wouldn't even. Of course, you pay your cleaning lady in cash. People would think that this is how this is how things are done, and people would take this for granted and normal. And I think it's it's a story of a, uh, on the one hand, of individual behaviors, but on the other hand, of the institutional settings. Because, say, in Austria, if you have a cleaning lady, you can actually pay them. You can provide her with a, with a privatrechnung sort of thing, where where she actually gets some minimal uh, health security pay uh, payments from that. You can actually do that, you can actually arrange that. So there's this possibility and people can actually do this. Of course, they still don't do it so much because it's complicated. Uh, the, the easier way is just to give the 20 euro or 50 euro and, and let it go. But, but things change if you have, I, I, I think, this is where the institutions could step in. This is where the institutions could provide a solution because people pay, you know, people do this, be engage in the, in the gray economy and pay, pay the, the cleaning ladies in cash because they don't see any other way. The, the institutions don't provide any other way of, of, of doing this. So yeah, that, that's, I think that's an excellent point and it's very much a middle class thing, right? Uh, thank you, uh, and I'm sorry, but we have uh, time for one last question. I've seen Veronica. Thank you very much. Uh, Hi, my name is Veronica, and uh, I'm representing Naradze Milana Šimečku. But before that, I used to work for uh, Rada Mladeže Slovenska, who do a lot of research on young people. And we actually do have some data that is very interesting and relevant, which is also why I so impolitely shouted, yes, there is a very low uh, trust in uh, in uh, individuals uh, among each other. It's only 20%, whether it's adults or, or, or young people, only 20% of, of um, people in Slovakia or Czech Republic, but post-communist countries in general, uh, have a trust in each other. And there is exactly what you said. There is a uh, c correlation between trust in, in each other and trust in institutions, which is what we're battling with uh, tremendously. But what we found out in, in one of our studies was um, that actually the, the membership in, organ in youth organizations uh, contribute to a greater trust by it increases from 20 to 30 percent. Uh, so young people who are members of youth organizations, they tend to trust each other um, more than those that don't. They also trust, they have also higher trust in institutions. Um, and what was very interesting, especially in Slovakia, it was a comparison, uh, comparative uh, research from uh, Slovakia and Czech Republic. And what we found out in Slovakia, that um, in the age cohort of 20 to 25, that was the moment when uh, young people had the highest trust, uh, either towards like towards um, each other in the society. But then it went down, like skyrocketed by 10% into to like 15%, which is very interesting. And and our explanation at that time was that's the first time that the young people start to hit the the labor market, and you know in Slovakia, especially for young people, the the measures are are um, well, they're not very sort of there's no safety net for young people. And when they hit the, the labor market, that's actually when they sort of, you know, they're burned and their trust in each other and in the networks that they have plummets down. And so I think when, you know, when sort of also looking at the question that is up there, what may be, what may be my or our contribution is actually work, work with young people, engage them, provide those networks 
And, you know, we, for future, may have a society that is more trusting either in each other or institutions would be my sort of contribution. I, uh, if there is anything to add to this, I don't really... <laughs> I think, I mean, if you, you said it beautifully. I, uh, um, of course, I, I will be interested in your data. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but uh, yeah, um, I mean the, the age of 25 is interesting. Also, I think sadly, also it may be because that's where people start hitting the realities of the housing market, which of course is a very you know, frustrating experience. But but I, I, I like the, the, what you mentioned that you have this uh, positive correlation between people being um, being members of. Um, of civic society organizations and being trusting because I think being a member of something and being involved in, in some sort of collective effort also gives you a sense of self-efficacy, of being, of, of I am able to contribute to something, I am able to do something. And you can see how much people are craving for this feeling. With the beginning of the war in Ukraine and with everybody contributing, we, were, we, we want to have this feeling. We want to be engaged. We want to feel like we are contributing to history. Even when, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic and this whole story about people suing their own uh, masks and so, so on and so forth. That's, uh, I think people are, yeah, that's, um, that's maybe the good news. That people, are, people want to be a part of something. People want to be uh, a part of a solution, I hope. Oh, thank you, thank you very much, and I'm really, really sorry we have to cut this uh, this extremely interesting uh, discussion, but we have to move on. I'm sure that we will receive your presentation in our uh, conference uh, conference package, and uh, I'm sure. And I also want to do the the promo for your for your book, The Unknown Society, which I'm really personally uh, very, very curious. And uh, thank you, uh, thank you for this. I think yeah, yeah, that with your last uh, last answer, that the the feeling that what we want to uh, that how how to how to feel not so helpless because this is one of the worst uh, feeling feeling ever but we want to feel feel useful uh, and this is also uh, might be an answer to the to the question how we can as an individual person uh, contribute to less let's say fragmented uh, society so thank you very much this was really really interesting thanks a lot thank you thanks so much.